Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Jill P.A., and I'm delighted to welcome you to Baroness Jean Corston's public lecture, Women in Prison, More Troubled Than Troublesome. Um, this topic is particularly apposite because, as I'm sure many of you will know, tomorrow is World Mental Health Day. So. Now, um, important issues first. Our Twitter hashtag is LSE Women in Prison. Um, I find this slightly unsettling because there are quite a few of us LSE women. So. Um, Second, the event is being video and audio recorded, um, and assuming there are no technical difficulties, uh, there will be a podcast available online in due course. Third, timing. Uh, Baroness Corston is going to speak for about 45 minutes, and then there will be 45 minutes of questions, and we need to finish by 8 o'clock. Now, I just wanted to say a few words by way of introduction, because Baroness Corston has had an exceptional and, frankly, inspirational career. Jean Corston came to the Law Department uh, at the LSE as a mature student. Um, that's unusual in itself, but as she was explaining to me just now, she was actually in her 40s when she came to the LSE as a student, which makes it very, very unusual. In fact, almost unheard of. So, um, she took an LLB with us and went on to qualify as a barrister. She then became the Labour MP for Bristol East, a seat that she held for some 13 years. And during that time, she also became the first female chair of the Parliamentary Labour Party. She chaired the Joint Committee on Human Rights and led a review into deaths in custody. So you can perhaps see why it is that she was eminently well qualified uh, when in 2006 the Home Office commissioned her to conduct a review of the position of vulnerable women in the criminal justice system following the deaths of some six women at Stile Prison. Her report, published in 2007, which was very quick, um, is known by everyone in the trade, and indeed probably by some people outside, as the Corston Report. It had 43 recommendations and made an argument, a coherent argument, for a radically new woman-centered approach to women's imprisonment and the way in which women are dealt with in the criminal justice system. And it elicited a response from the government which rejected only three of those recommendations. And indeed, one of them last week was rectified by the Sentencing Council when the Sentencing Council introduced greater flexibility with respect to the breach of community orders. So, um, her lecture tonight focuses very much on the prison end of her endeavours, although, as she says, the Corston Report covers the whole gamut, so um, don't be surprised if she strays into the system generally. Um, she will no doubt be reflecting on what has actually happened in the intervening 11 years, so I would invite you to welcome Baroness Corston. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. It is a pleasure to be back here almost 32 years to the day since I started as what I think probably was the Law Department's most elderly undergraduate of all time. This place was a life changer for me, as it has been for so many others, and I'm sure it will be for, for many of you. Um, Professor P.A. Has, has, has already said something about the introduction and the, the circumstances surrounding my report. But this talk is about some of the most marginalized and misunderstood people in our society, women in the criminal justice system. And I want to introduce the subject by setting out the background to my report, which was commissioned in March 2006 
completed by the 1st of January 2007 and published by the Home Office in March of the same year. In 2003, 14 women took their own lives in prisons in England. These deaths are categorised by the prison service as self-inflicted because one can never be sure that death was the intention. Sometimes it is a cry for help which no one hears. In 2004, 13 women died, six of them in one prison, style in Cheshire. Towards the end of that time, the then Home Secretary, Charles Clark, had given to the new prisons and probation ombudsman the responsibility of conducting an independent investigation into all deaths in custody, a task previously allocated in-house to a governor from another prison. Concurrently, there were calls for a public inquiry, principally from a woman called Pauline Campbell, whose daughter Sarah had died in style at the age of 18. Sarah had got in with what we would call the wrong crowd and ended up committing petty street crime so as to fund a drug habit. She harried an elderly man in the street for money, but he collapsed with a fatal heart attack. Sarah was charged with manslaughter. Pauline Campbell was the antithesis of a mother of a woman in prison. She was elegant, middle class, articulate, professional, and she started a one-woman campaigning campaign protesting outside any prison where a woman had died, making sure she would be arrested and calling for public inquiry. As can be imagined, she became a challenge to Charles Clark because she was such an effective campaigner. And one of the things of which I am most proud is that Pauline first treated me with the utmost hostility and scorn. She had assumed that I was an establishment figure and that my report would be a whitewash. A year later at a conference, she gave me a hug and she said, I'm due to appear in court again soon. Will you defend me? <laughs> I explained that I no longer had a practicing certificate as a barrister, but Pauline did not live to see any significant change in the situation. She was found dead on Sarah's grave in May 2008. Charles Clark saw no useful purpose in a public inquiry because he reasoned that the Ombudsman's report into the last death at style, that of a young woman called Julie Walsh, would encompass all the others. I think that he was also very affected by a letter written to him by the coroner for Cheshire, Nicholas Reinberg, in which he wrote, referring to the witnesses who appeared before him at Julie Walsh's inquest, I saw a group of damaged individuals committing for the most part petty crime for whom imprisonment represented a disproportionate response. That was what particularly struck me with Julie Walsh, who had spent the majority of her adult life serving at regular intervals short periods of imprisonment for crimes which represented a social nuisance rather than anything that demanded the most extreme form of punishment. I was greatly saddened by the pathetic individuals who came before me as witnesses, who no doubt mirrored the pathetic individuals who had died. A far-ranging review, concentrating on alternatives to imprisonment for drug-dependent women coming before the courts charged with petty crime would be a very valuable exercise. Charles Clark and his ministerial team, which included three women, decided not to respond by commissioning yet more research, which had been recommended by senior officials. The women in the ministerial team said they wanted a practical piece of work, drawing on the research of the previous 30 years, all of which, by the way, pointed in the same direction, and to make recommendations. Civil servants said that they did not know of such a person. Ministers said that they did. And this is where I was asked to come on the scene. I was not entirely new to the subject. As a member of the Home Affairs Select Committee of the House of Commons, I visited Holloway Prison in London in 1994 and will never forget my first sight of a baby in prison. 
and as the founding chair of Parliament's Joint Committee on Human Rights, I had led an inquiry into deaths in all forms of state custody, prompted by the death of one of my young African Caribbean constituents in Dartmoor Prison as a result of face-down restraint. My terms of reference from the Minister, Baroness Patricia Scotland, who is now the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, made reference to vulnerable women. I replied, saying, it may be unhelpful to continue describing women with highly complex sets of problems, often stemming from long histories of abuse and lack of care, as vulnerable, or as I have heard them called, poor copers or inadequates. This labelling only serves to sustain the per perception of the public, staff, and the women themselves that they are second-class citizens, undeserving undeserving of care and compassion and treatment as individual people and impervious to change. I went on to say that I therefore declined to define vulnerable as required by the terms of reference and would instead consider these women in terms of their vulnerabilities. It is unusual to say the least for anyone to decline terms of reference from the minister but I'd made it clear at the outset that the work would be my own that I would require the assistance of Home Office officials, that I would be able to go where I chose and talk to anyone I wished, and that my report would be published in full without amendment. This had all been agreed. I then set out what I considered to be the dimensions of these vulnerabilities, which I considered fell into three categories. First, domestic circumstances and problems such as domestic violence, childcare issues, being a single parent. Second, personal circumstances such as mental illness, sexual abuse, low self-esteem, eating disorders, substance misuse. And third, socioeconomic factors such as poverty, isolation and unemployment. I contended that when women are experiencing a combination of factors from each of these three types of vulnerabilities, it was likely to lead to a crisis point that ultimately results in prison. Fortunately, Baroness Scotland acknowledged the dangers of labelling women in this way and agreed with my decision not to do so. I also determined to consider women at risk of offending. I set up a reference group of experts to assist me. They were a diverse group, the prisons and probation ombudsman, a woman former prison governor, representatives of criminal justice campaigning organisations, civil servants with specialist responsibilities in mental health, women's offending and safer custody, mostly from the prisons and probation services. We met eight times during the review, which started on the 1st of March 2006. The written report was on the minister's desk by the 31st of December, so it was a tight timescale. During that nine-month period, I held five consultation events, visited six women's prisons, three women's community centres, and one medium-secure women's hospital, often accompanied by members of the reference group. I held over 40 meetings with individuals and groups. Over 250 people contributed in some way. So, I found that in the decade ending in 2006, the women's prison population rose by 94%. The corresponding rise for men was 38%. And the reason was quite simple. Courts were using custody more frequently for women for less serious offences. This was brought home to me when I attended a round table involving judges, magistrates, coroners, social workers and lawyers. I was sitting next to a very senior judge on the Northwestern Circuit. When I stated that women were dealt with by the courts more severely than men, he asserted that I was quite wrong. So I told him of a woman in Holloway Prison serving life for a first offence of wounding with intent. She had taken her own life in prison. I asked him whether any man would have received such a sentence for the same offence. He merely patted my hand and said, you must be mistaken, my dear. At that time, there were about 4,500 women in prison, in prisons in England at any one time. 
This includes women from Wales, given that there are no women's prisons in Wales, and I hope there won't be. There were about 80,000 men. It is easy to see why women could be an overlooked afterthought. Nearly three quarters of women sentenced to custody are there for less than 12 months. Significantly, only 45% of women remanded into custody go on to receive a custodial sentence. They are generally on remand for 28 days, long enough to lose home and children, with little chance of getting either back, of which I shall say more later. Only 3.2% of this total female population are assessed as presenting a high or very high risk of serious harm to others in the community, compared with 11.4% of male prisoners. I want to stress at this point that I am not one of those people who say that no woman should ever be held in prison. There are a small number of women in English prisons who are rightly deprived of their liberty. Now, to the personal side of those numbers. 80% of these women have mental health problems. At least half of them were a suicide risk before they went into prison. When they are released, they are about 30 times more likely than women in the general population to take their own lives. Nearly three quarters of them are drug dependent and not just class A drugs. Some women entering prison can have a poly drug mis misuse of prescription and illegal drugs and alcohol. I found that sexual and violent victimization often triggers offending. And what I found absolutely extraordinary was the degree of abuse suffered by these women. Over half of them will admit to some for form of abuse. It is shocking how often it is childhood sexual abuse, leaving them feeling, feeling not only a total lack of self-confidence, but a lack of self-worth. Because of course, like most victims, they blame themselves. And what makes me particularly angry is that we are rightly exercised about paedophiles while generally giving scant regard to their victims, many of whom end up in prison. They are people with no life skills. And I mean no life skills. The things that we all take for granted, that we think are part of the human condition, are actually things we learn if we are lucky. How to hold a conversation how to make a persuasive phone call, how to work with and cooperate with others, how to keep appointments. It is extraordinary how many of these women do not have these skills. I heard of women who did not even know how to clean a toilet because they had never seen a toilet brush or a tub of toilet cleaner. If you can't do any of these things, then your parenting isn't up to much, you're not a very good neighbour, you're not a very good citizen. And they self-harm. Women make up 5% of the prison population, but they are responsible for 51% of the self-harm, much of which is too shocking to describe. Last year, in 2017, 8,317 instances of self-harm were documented in women's prisons. Self-harm has to be recognised as an understandable phenomenon when a person has responsibility but no control over their lives. One of the women who took her own life in prison was charged with arson. She had set fire to herself in bed, thereby endangering the lives of others. We can only guess her mental state. They commit offences that are frequently associated with poverty and financial difficulties. Shoplifting for food for the family is common. Handling stolen goods for male partners is not unusual and they are mothers. Every year in England and Wales, about 17,000 children are affected by the imprisonment of their mothers. A large number of these children will end up in prison themselves. I have been told as many as half of them. Only 5% of these children will stay in the family home, and generally their fathers don't look after them. If a man goes to prison, there is generally someone to keep the home fires burning, and at least the children are okay. And these women try to bring up their children from prison. You can hear them on the phone doing just that. Many of them keep having babies. There were press reports two years ago of a woman who had had 18 babies, all taken away at birth. These women want to be allowed to keep one. 
and need help with the skills and means to do so. They're held a long way from home because there are so few women's prisons, so there can be horrendous round trips to see mummy. And anyway, people don't generally visit women in the numbers visiting men. A male prison at visiting times is packed. A women's prison isn't. This break in contact between mother and child can be catastrophic. The children of women in prison are, more often than not, taken into care. If they stay in the family, living with a grandmother or aunt, they often do not want to change home and school again to live with their mothers. And on release, none of the women's offending behaviour has been dealt with because you can't do much in a few weeks or months. On release, the biggest hurdle is accommodation. Traditionally, if you ask anyone what is the most important priority for a prisoner on release, the answer will be employability. You don't have to look very far to know that for women it is accommodation. Time and again, I heard the heartbreaking lament, I just want somewhere for me and my kids. So they go to the local authority housing department and at best are told that they are not eligible for family accommodation because they do not have their children with them and are offered, at best, a one-bedroom flat. At worst, they were told that they made themselves intentionally homeless by going to prison and consequently are not eligible for council housing, although I hope we've put a stop to that. They go to social services and are told that they cannot have their children back because either they have nowhere to live or are in a one-bedroom flat, which is not suitable for family accommodation. This is a downward spiral. I heard of a woman who gave birth in style. She herself was born there. Finally, I found that there was no one person or distinct body which had overall responsibility for women's prisons. They were always an afterthought on any agenda. As to my conclusions, I made 43 recommendations in all. 40 of them were accepted, although some were accepted with qualification. My main contention was that prison was a male construct. Prisons are designed for men and are, by and large, run by men. The re regime was tailored to men's needs and offending be and behavioural profile. Extreme security, constant searching. I have never heard of a woman escaping pr from prison, and if she did, she'd be easy to find. She would try to be with her children. So I concluded that as men and women are obviously different, there ought to be a prison regime tailored to women's needs. My central premise was that men and women are different but equal. Treating them the same does not deliver equality. I consider that this flew in the face of the gender equality duty, which was due to come in force in April 2008. Subsequently, the Ministry of Justice, which had assumed responsibility for the prison estate, did publish a gender equality scheme. It will not surprise you to know that I concluded that prison was an entirely inappropriate place for turning these women's lives around. I called for the closure of women's prisons to be replaced with small custodial units and a network of women's centres to be used but for referrals by the courts and other public bodies and individuals like family doctors who often can identify a chaotic lifestyle which so often leads to offending. There are already a few opened and functioning well often set up by enterprising women with experience of working with women in the criminal justice system. I visited such centres in Halifax, Worcester and Glasgow and saw for myself that by taking a woman-centred approach, lives can be turned around. Issues like mental ill health, debt, life skills, substance misuse, accommodation, parenting and diet could all be dealt with one-to-one -one under one roof by qualified professionals, far more effective than making dozens of appointments with different organizations for women whose lives are so chaotic that a failure to keep appointments is a problem in itself. I met a woman in one of these centers. She was 41 years old and had been in and out of prison or in trouble with the police since the age of 15. She had three children. The first had been put up for adoption without her consent, which happens often. The second was in care, with little chance of be, being reunited. She was in the process of setting up home with her third child. 
I asked why she was at the centre, and she told me that a magistrate had sent her there because prison clearly had not ha had any positive influence in her life. I asked what had been the outcome for her, and she said, when I have been in prison, there was always someone else I could blame. If my stepdad hadn't done that to me, if my mother had protected me, if that man hadn't abused me, if I hadn't got pregnant, if I hadn't taken drugs, if I hadn't been coerced into prostitution because I was poor, it was always someone else's fault. Now, I am 41, and this is the first time someone has sat down with me and asked, what's your responsibility for being in this situation? And she added, actually, it's much harder than being in prison. But I do really feel that I'm turning my life around. I always asked such women whether they liked themselves, something they'd never been asked before. This woman said she was beginning to do so, and I told her that in that case, she would be okay. It is my contention that this is the foundation of self-esteem and self-confidence. When I was working on my report, I was told that the total cost of keeping a woman in prison for a year was £70,000. The cost of a place at the centre in Worcester was £750. I know which I think is a better value for money on every count. Another of my recommendations was that the routine strip searching regime should be radically changed. Women were repeatedly and routinely strip searched on reception into prison, before going to court, on return to prison, even though they had been under supervision throughout. Once again, it forms part of the male regime. But when I visited women's prisons and after see the search book, it was generally empty. And indeed, I had, as a matter of courtesy, called on the Director General of the Prison Service when I started my review, and I asked him about strip searching, and he was very angry. He said to me, if you think you're going to stop to abolish routine strip searching on my watch, you can think again. But I did. Prison governors to whom I spoke said that they never found anything during these searches, and I considered them to be a waste of staff time and a terrible thing to do to women who'd been victims of abuse. I'm proud to tell you that following a pilot project in four women's prisons, which was entirely successful, routine strip searching was abolished in the women's estate on the 1st of April, 2009. Now, women are searched on reception into prison, though they are allowed to keep their underwear on, previously denied, and subsequently on an intelligence-led basis. Then came the hard bit, implementation. I want to stress at the outset that none of this would have happened without a critical mass of women ministers. The woman given the main responsibility in the Home Office, Maria Eagle MP, was magnificent, as was Vera Baird, then the Solicitor General, previously an eminent Queen's Counsel who had virtually single-handedly changed the law on battered women who kill and who is now the Police and Crime Commissioner for Northumbria. But they were supported by women ministers from other departments, health, communities and local government were compensions, to name a few. At a time of looming financial meltdown, we managed to persuade the Home Secretary, Jack Straw MP, to commit £15.6 million as seed corn money to set up women's centres. The numbers shot up, and by January 2013, there were 51 throughout England and Wales, most of them with diverse funding streams. Progress for the next three years was rapid, a cross-departmental criminal justice women's unit was set up in the newly created Ministry of Justice. This worked through a ministerial subgroup specifically on women, but reporting to the reducing reoffending ministerial group. This ensured that women were not item number 15 on that group's agenda, which is what so often happens. The cross-departmental nature of the unit was remarkable. To get civil servants from different departments to work together in one place was no mean feat. It did not surprise me when the numbers of women in our prisons began to reduce. There are now just under 3,900, a reduction of over 400 since 2007. Consequently, two women's prisons have been re-rolled, as it is called, for men. This must have saved a lot of money. In some parts of the country, a conditional caution scheme was introduced, providing women who've admitted committing a low-level offence the opportunity be to, to be diverted from court by accepting a caution, 
with the condition that they attend a women's centre for an assessment. A national service framework for women offenders was issued, as was an offender management guide to working with women, so as to improve probation's response to working with women. A set of gender-specific standards for women's prisons was established. And the funding of an additional £15.6 million was allocated in 2009-10 to invest in additional service in the services in the community for women offenders, who are not a danger to the public and women at risk of offending, so as to develop one-stop shop services and bail support to better meet the needs of women. The National Offender Management Service, NOMS, known by some of us at the time as Nightmare on Marsham Street, because that's where it was cited, developed a women awareness staff programme, a course for all staff and volunteers working with women. During the first year alone, 640 staff were trained and the course has now been adapted for use in the community. A training programme for staff called Sex Workers in Prison was developed, enabling women to discuss their experiences and receive support while in prison to assess them in leaving, assist them in leaving sex work. Shortly after the report was published, I was approached by representatives of charitable trusts, foundations and individual ph philanthropists to discuss ways in which they could assist with implementation of my report. They had previously funded projects in women's prisons, but my report had led them to believe that they had been working in a system designed to fail. We met in Holloway Prison in the summer of 2007, and I suggested ways in which they could work consistent with my report. I then forgot all about it until I got an email the following year from a woman talking about the course and report and progress with the CIFC. I replied asking what the CIFC was. She said it was the course and independent funders coalition. Asked who they were, she said they were the people I'd met in Holloway. They'd got together, agreed to do as I suggested, and suddenly realised they'd not asked if they could use my name. I was flattered that they should want to do so. They comprised 21 such organisations or individuals, and they set up a £2.3 million women's diversionary fund with the Ministry of Justice during 2009-10 to divert women from custody. There emerged a whole new co cohort of women who worked in these centres. It was like an entirely new profession springing up. Many of them had been in prison themselves, and the example they set of how it, is impossible to how it is possible to turn a life around was truly inspiring, particularly to service users. I find myself sharing platforms with such women. It was inspiring. And the suicide numbers went down. There was one in 2008, and the highest number in the next seven years was five. The Labour government was defeated in 2010 and we had five years of coalition. Initially, it was a period of marking time at best. The first thing that happened was that the Criminal Justice Women's Unit was disbanded. I don't think that was necessarily a ministerial decision. I've always suspected that this was a decision taken by civil servants and that ministers in the incoming government knew nothing about it. As I've said, officialdom does not take easily to that kind of interdepartmental inter initiative but it meant that the ability to work across all aspects of the women's prison estate, as well as prog progress on community provision, was lost. And as an aside, when we were elected in 1997 as a Labour government, I was one of the people charged with helping to set up the first ever national childcare strategy. And you would not believe the, the, the interdepartmental civil war about A, who was going to write the minutes, and B, who was going to do the position paper for Tony Blair, the Prime Minister. It took a very long time. The ministerial group on reducing women's reoffending was also abolished. Apart from anything else, there were no women ministers in the department at that time. The women's centres continued to operate, but their funding became more precarious. They limped on from year to year, not knowing whether government support would continue. Their recidivism rates were impressive, but it was not easy to prove because we had never established a set of standards against which their success could be judged. The Ministry of Justice conducted research which showed that what has since been called the Causton approach did reduce women's reoffending. 
However, in September 2012, a new Secretary of State for Justice was appointed, Chris Grayling. He set about privatising probation services under a new policy initiative called Transforming Rehabilitation, which has been known as TR, which provided that services would be provided, provided through community rehabilitation companies, CRCs. At the time, the Justice Select Committee of the House of Commons, in a report entitled Women Offenders and the Corson Report, said that TR risked, quote, dismantling a system which emerging evidence suggests is working very well. I met the minister responsible for the women's prison estate at the time to point out that women's centres would find it impossible to fit into the TR model. It assumed that contracting bodies would provide a single service to offenders. Women's centres provided a whole range of services. Furthermore, most of the contracts provided only for short-term group work with offenders, so the one-to-one -one model used by the women's centres was never going to conform. There was a, a pre-TR pilot at one prison, Peterborough. Peterborough is a men's prison. The grim reality for small women's services was made clear when the National Offender Management Service confirmed that funds for the women's sector beyond 2013 would come through the commissioning framework drawn up as part of transforming rehabilitation. And women's projects were told that they had to engage with the CRCs if they were to be commissioned in the, fut in the future. Assurances were given to the Course and Independent Funders Coalition and others raising concerns that there would be clarity in expectations on the services needed for women, both in the commissioning framework and contract process. It is hardly surprising that Corston and coalition members concluded that the proposals represented an inappropriate funding model for an approach to which they and other funders had made a major investment. They now work solely with women at risk of offending and call themselves a gender. The result of this revolution has been that about 30% of probation staff are employed in a new national probation service, and the remaining 70% are employed in 21 community rehabilitation companies at a cost of £4 billion, an ownership of which passed to a variety of different companies by means of a share sale. This happened in February 2015. These are the organisations with which the women's centres were supposed to agree contracts. The community rehabilitation companies are not subject to the Freedom of Information Act and parliamentary questions are often not answered on the grounds of commercial confidentiality. Some of the companies do have charitable sector input but the main players are multinationals like Sodexo, Ingios Limited, MTC, which is a US-based correctional facility, and Cap Gem Gemini. There is one CRC in the Northeast, which is a joint venture, including charities and the local National Health Service. All the partners are local. At the time, the Ministry of Justice claimed that the Grayling reforms would save the taxpayer £200 million a year. The House of Commons Justice Committee described the reformers as a mess, and unlikely ever to work. The Public Accounts Committee raised the alarm in March of this year, concerned that most CRCs were not financially sustainable, despite the injection of an additional £342 million of taxpayers' money. The effect on probation has been dire. Her Majesty's Chief, Chief Officer of Probation, Dame Glenys Stacey, has reported that for many people, a probation appointment has been reduced to a chat in a cafe or a phone call every six weeks. The effect on women's centres has been entirely negative so far. One centre, for example, spent a vast amount of time and energy on TR, only to be offered a 144-page commercial contract, which included gagging clauses, which they refused to accept. They now focus entirely on women at risk of offending, funded by charitable donations. Another centre was presented with a contract which contained a term which stipulated a 10,000 fee to renegotiate any contractual term. This kind of business climate is entirely inappropriate for women's centres, 
given that virtually all of them are charities working on a tight budget. As predicted, the CRC model did not work. As one centre manager put it to me, it is a tick box model rather than working with each woman to see what she needs. I inquired on what research CRCs were relying in order to deliver women's services. The preferred model for some of them is the University of Cincinnati, Cincinnati's Cognitive Behaviour Moving On program. It has certainly been described to me as an evidence base. It takes us back years. Strip out the jargon and it requires women to think and behave differently. I have consistently argued to successive ministers and secretaries of state that the Women's Centre should be taken out of transforming rehabilitation and funded directly by the prison and probation service. Offenders have always faced the prospect of recall to prison if they breach any of the terms of their release. Missing a probation appointment counts as a breach. A sick child at home or missing a bus is a breach. Previously, if someone served a sentence of less than 12 months, they were not subject to probation supervision. Now, under TR, they are under a mix of license and supervision conditions for at least 12 months and can be recalled to prison for any breach during the license period. Recall carries a further sentence of two weeks imprisonment. Some women have been recalled several times, a total of 271 in 2016. So it is a revolving door of release, breach, recall, release. I have been told that hundreds more women are now being recalled to prison under this system, often for non-attendance. Nobody has apparently asked what happens to children or the chance of mother and child reunion under this process. Chris Grayling left the Ministry of Justice in July 2016, moving, moving to transport, and was replaced by Liz Truss until after the 27 general election, when David Gork took over. Reality seemed to dawn. At the end of this July, as Parliament was rising for the summer, it was announced that the CRC contracts would be terminated early in 2020, two years earlier than planned. There is no clarity about what will replace them, though it is rumoured that the service will continue to be run by the private sector by 11 CRCs rather than 21. It has been reported that the extra cost of this failed policy is £170 million. We were promised a new female offender strategy. It initially included plans for five new women's prisons on shared sites with men, the worst of all worlds, but there was such an outcry, particularly from the all-party parliamentary group for women in the penal system, which I chair. After five years' gestation, the strategy was published in the summer and recommends five new community women's centres, which will be residential. I assume this means that the women will be locked in. When I asked David Gort what would happen to the women's children, he just gave me a blank look. There seems to be no money to properly fund the strategy. So how have the numbers of women in prison not increased dramatically? One explanation is the work that the centres do in working with women at risk of offending. It is also now obvious that the deep cuts in the prison service and police budgets have led to a great reduction in staffing levels. The Ministry of Justice budget has been cut by 30% in recent years and is facing further cuts of 20% in its budget by 2020. We've all seen on our TV screens the consequences of this policy. Riots, prison damage, staff injury. So many staff who were skilled at emotional intelligence and diffusing violent confrontations are no longer there. And consequently, there are not so many arrests for low-level crime, like shoplifting, because of police staffing cuts. Working in a women's prison can be a harrowing experience and a full complement of staff is essential in reducing the numbers of deaths. As an example, women who intend to take their lives often do not try to hang themselves. They ligature, tying something round their necks and just pulling. So it's obvious that extreme vigilance can sometimes be crucial. One of the women who died just before I reported ligatured 83 times and was discovered each time by staff, just in time. 
On the 84th attempt, she, she succeeded in killing herself. And I am sad to say that in 2016, 22 women died in English prisons, 12 of whom took their own lives. The highest number on record, it is getting back to square one. Meanwhile, the Scottish Government is doing just what I recommended, given that a report commissioned by them from Dame Eilish Angiolini came to identical conclusions. I know that the Women's Centre model works. I have met more than one woman who has said to me, I am alive because of you. Um, about two years after I reported, I was listening to, I was doing the ironing one Saturday and listening to Weekend Women's Hour, and burnt myself when I heard my name. It was a piece uh, about a women's centre. And the journalist was speaking to two women who had been in and out of prison, but had then gone to a women's centre. And they were asked what happened when they were admitted, and they said, we had to fill in a form, and we thought it was rubbish. It was things like, what did you want to be when you were, ch when you were a child? Are your children proud of you? Do you think you had a decent education? They said they were stupid questions, and we thought it was rubbish, but it was easier than being in prison. And then they talked about what had happened to them. And the journalist asked the right last question. If you're trained as a lawyer, you're often told in court, your last question can kill your case. But this, this journalist asked the right last question. She said, by the way, you know these forms that you said were rubbish? What happened to them? One said it was on her bedroom wall. The other said it was on her fridge. I also know that this system turns women's right lives around. It gives them self-confidence and self-esteem, that it makes their children proud of them. It might not seem much, but it could be the whole world to these women, and it makes them better neighbours, and that is in everyone's interests. Thank you. Tangled up with it. Thank you so much. I mean, that was a real roller coaster of a, a tale that you have to tell. I mean, it, it's obviously heart wrenching in parts. I mean, really heart wrenching in parts. It is heart wrenching sometimes to see to see the effect of not having any kind of feminist perspective. Yeah. You know, this is something that tends to get rubbished in the media, but you know. You have to understand the reality of some women's lives and not judge them yeah. and know that they actually, they want to be like us, but they don't know how to be like us. And what is so exciting about going to a women's centre is that that's what they do. They learn to be like us. They learn to have a conversation, you know. They learn to turn up on time. And that, that's one of the other things that's so telling about what you had to say is that it, it's, it's testament to the, the power of possibility. Yes, Just, it, it, you know, it, it's very e energising in that sense. But the, the, the kind of end of the tale, where the kind of edifice begins to come crashing down, I mean, it's deeply depressing. So, anyway, um, we're in a, a relatively intimate setting here. Um, we've got 40 minutes. Um, Just I have my glasses case oh, there, so I'll get it. Sorry. Because I'm <laughs> in the habit of leaving it there. We've got 40 minutes, so I hope that a number of you will feel that there are questions that you want to ask Baroness Corston, and we've got plenty of time to do them justice. And please so address me as Jean. I leave Jean. the Baroness behind in Westminster. Okay, Jean. <laughs> right, questions for Jean. Yes, we do have some um, microphones, so if you could just sort of just briefly say who you are um, to preface your question, that would be helpful, thanks. Right. Hi, uh, Jean and Jill. Uh, I have nothing to do with the prison system and work. My name's Tessa. Um, I was curious to know what offences you did think it was suitable to imprison women for. Sorry, I, I don't know whether it's my hearing or whether oh. the, the microphone's not working. Um, I wondered what questions, what 
offences you did think it was suitable to imprison women for? Um, well, offences which of of violent offences. Um, you know, there are women like Rosemary West who assisted her husband in murdering children. Obviously, she should be in prison. I think that we read in our newspapers, perhaps about once a month, about a woman who probably should be in prison. But one of the women who I knew of was in Bristol, the city that I was proud to represent in the House of Commons. And this woman was sent to prison for shoplifting 99 times. Now, if I say that to all of you, I'm sure you will think, well, shoplifting 99 times, bang her up. When you scratch the surface and you find that she's in a relationship of coercive control with a man who monitors every minute of her life, even checks the waste paper basket in the bathroom, the, the rubbish bu 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 uh, bucket in the bathroom to make sure there's no hairs from another person's head in the house, and that he gives her no money, and that all she's got is the um, child benefit, and she shoplifts to feed her children. Should she be in prison for six months? I don't think so. I don't think so. And that is all too often a reality. What about a woman who, whose children keep talking about things on television that their friends at school watch? But this woman can't switch on her television because she can't afford the television license. And the children nag and nag and get upset, so she, she switches the television on. And then she gets a letter from TV licensing asking whether she is, has paid a TV license. And she owns up. She says she hasn't paid it. So she can't afford a £146 or whatever it is um, license fee. So she's sent to court and she can be then fined £1,400 for not paying it. So she ends up in prison. Now, I, I don't think women like that should be in prison. Actually, I don't think men like that should be in prison, but I don't think there are that many of them. Because I always used to say that if what I had recommended works for women in prison, I'd like to think some of it, some of it would rub off on vulnerable men in our prisons, of whom there are many. Um, Elaine, Play <coughs> Elaine Player, King's College. One of the things you, you didn't mention, Jean, was the, the sort of flowing in pipe, the, the process by which these women end up in the situation in custody that you, you discussed so, so clearly. How do we um, control sentences? Because we have clearly set out in legislation that custody should be a last resort. Custody should be used when no other sentence is appropriate. And yet sentences routinely say we only use custody as a last resort. Now, clearly the data shows that that is entirely untrue. And so we've all been singing from the same hymn book for many, many years now, except for the judiciary. And I just wonder whether you have any thoughts on how we might prevent the women's centres that you have successfully set up being used for women who, should, uh, who would be uh, diverted from custody, as opposed to women who were not going to custody at all, but it just simply expands the other non-custodial options. So how do we do something about sentencing in this country? Well, um, that's a very apposite question. To my absolute astonishment about... Two months ago, when Parliament was about to, to rise for the summer recess, I was asked to meet a Lords Minister, who's obviously a Conservative, not the same party as me, because he wanted to talk to me about women in prison. And nobody could accuse him of having a feminist perspective, but at least he was prepared to listen. And I said to him, one of the great problems, and I found this throughout my life in organisations I've been involved with, is corporate knowledge. So when I, when I reported, 
I had very good relationships with the Magistrates Association. And I talked to them about what they ought to do and the confidence they should have in women's centres and that they should visit any women's centre that was in their area. Admittedly, when I, when I first went round, there were four women's centres and they became 51. So obviously not wasn't one everywhere. Um, but this began to be disseminated throughout the magistracy. You know, have some confidence in, in women's centres. And of course, the, the officers of the Magistrates Association change year on year. And that, that is completely gone now for the Magistrates Association. That is going to be evidenced in a report which I'm hoping to publish next week, which is the all-party parliamentary uh, group on women in the penal system. We are, we are publishing a report through the Howard League next week on the sentencing of women. I also told the minister that I went to see the chairman of the Bar Council about barristers and, and, and also, obviously, solic the solicitors' organisation too, about how they should treat women and the confidence they ought to have in a, in a women's centre. That's now gone. It's corporate memory. And I don't have the authority anymore. You know, I'm not part of government. I don't have the authority anymore to go around doing that. But I did say to him, this is what you should do. You should talk to the Bar Council. You should talk to the Solicitor's Authority. You should talk to the Magistracy. You should get them to go and visit their local women's centre so that the scales fall from their eyes and they realise that for a fraction of the money, they can have an entirely positive outcome. I mean, I, I, I so know it's a council of despair, <laughs> but... <laughs> I, I, do you want to do you want to just follow up because I, otherwise I was going to follow up myself. So. No, no, you, you carry on. So, sorry, Elaine and I were both involved in a study of uh, judicial sentencing back in the 1980s. So this is an issue that touches our hearts very firmly. So you go for it. Well, I, I understand that gentle persuasion is always um, preferable to a more coercive approach. But we've had decades and decades of trying to gently persuade sentences to change their, 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 their uh, practices. And perhaps some of them do for some of the time. But as you have just, again, very eloquently stated, it doesn't have any, any longevity attached to it yeah. and is terribly fragile. Now, it's very difficult to think of any other area of public service where if they continue, if these public servants continue to flout what is established good practice and there is a taxpayer's uh, saving attached to it as well, that something more coercive wouldn't be done to them. And yet, it does seem that we just are not prepared to take on sentences in any really robust way. And that seems to me to be very unfortunate. I think that's undoubtedly true. I think part of it, of course, is that some people worry about newspaper headlines, about politicians interfering with the legal process. Um, but... They do, um, and sometimes change is just happenstance. I, I practice as a barrister in Bristol, and I shared a room with somebody, well, with two people actually, and they, were both, they both did crime. I did a lot of discrimination, race and sex discrimination and family work. And one of them is now a judge. And somebody mentioned the Corson report to him, and he said, is that Jean? And they said, yes, oh, I'll read that, he said, because I know Jean. And I went to a Howard League function in Bristol, a, I can't, a few years ago, and there he was. So, you know, it was great to see him. And he said, I implement your report. I said, do you? He said, yeah, I do. He said, you're right. He said, sometimes I get in trouble with my colleagues, but I implement it. He said, because we have got a women's centre in Bristol. He said, it's called Eden House. I said, I know. And I said, well, why are you doing it? And he said, it was because it was your name on the cover. Now, you see, 
you can't spend your life worrying about anecdotes like that. And the, when I spoke to the minister in July, I said to him, you have the authority to go to the bar council, to the solicitor's authority and the magistracy. I said, because I took evidence from the chair of the Magistrates Association in June, and he didn't know what I was talking about. I'm sorry if it sounds like a council of despair, but I feel the need to keep going. <laughs> yeah, I think we all feel the need to keep going. <laughs> so, yes, please, uh, in the striped top. Can I suppose hi. I guess it's a follow-up, um, which is, in your report, um, you said that never before had there been so much research, much of it government-funded, um, to so little effect. And I paraphrase, sorry, very badly. So now that's 40 years' worth of research. And I just wonder, having a practice and research background myself and being so passionately um, and frustrated by this lack of being heard, what action or what can be done? Do we keep going? Who is going to listen? Well, I decided a long time that the only answer was just to keep going. Um, it is that this isn't the only thing I focus on in, in, in Parliament. I just recently chaired a select committee on social mobility and I'm a member of the Constitution Committee. But apart from that, this is what I do. And if there's anything comes up in Parliament on this subject, everybody looks to where I stand, where I sit, assuming I'm going to say something. And I do. And I know I'm a thorn in the government side, but I think that's my job. Um, it is difficult because, you know, the minister I spoke to said to me, and he was an advocate, and I said to him, but I don't suppose you did family law. He was quite shocked. Of course he didn't. He did commercial law. <laughs> and he said... Um, well, Jean, because I, when I, he was baronessing me, and I said, look, what's your name? And his mind's Jean, and he said his name was Richard. I said, well, okay. And I said to him, um, you know, you, you, you can talk, you can, you can do something about this. And if it would help, please remove my name from it. You know, I'm a Labour politician. It must be an irritant to you that I'm Labour and I have got associated with this. Take it over, call it something else. But you do need to have the humility to understand the reality of these women's lives. There was a question at the back. So. Um, Yvonne Roberts, chair of uh, a charity called Women in Prison, and Jean is our patron. So first of all, I want to thank Jean for all the amazing work she's done, because this just wouldn't even be on the agenda if there wasn't a Jean Causton. Secondly, I just wonder if we should start behaving more badly. Um, uh, we've all been very polite about it, and there's been endless research papers and endless commissions, and anybody who goes into a women's prison today will know that this is the bottom 25%. These are the women who are the victims of austerity, not just the victims of male violence and child abuse. These are the victims of austerity. Right, right. And to have a very complex system that allegedly is supposed to be helping women with complex needs is just balmy. Um, we're just setting them up to fail the whole time. And I wonder now, with the whole emphasis on men mental health and uh, and what Jean tried to do um, over a decade ago is to shift it into the public health framework. Maybe there is a new area there where we can keep pressing that these, most, the majority of these women actually suffer hugely from mental ill health yeah. and all the attending uh, addictions and, and, and abuses that come because of that. Maybe we just need to reframe the argument because unless we get the public on side, nothing is going to change. We need to embarrass government, be it Labour, Tory or any, any other mix of it, uh, a coalition to do something because it's costing taxpayers huge amounts of money. Mm. It's creating another generation of, 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 of children who will grow up and, and, as Jean said, will join, will, will like their mother, have give birth in, in style. So maybe it's time to be much more uh, disrespectful and, and seriously think about what we do in terms of direct action because I don't think anything else is really working. No, I think you're right. and. Um I would like to think there are more people who are vocal and passionate about it. Um, I'm not trying to suggest that I feel like a lone voice crying out in the wilderness, because I don't. But I am a bit worried sometimes at the number of people who talk about my report but haven't read it. 
and don't have any understanding or any idea of what I was saying about these women in prison. And I would like it very much if there was a rising cohort of people who, who wanted to call attention to these terrible injustices. And not just terrible injustices, it's appalling waste of money. Um, because, it, you know, sending these women to prison, it, it does nothing. I mean, Vicky Price, do those of you remember Vicky Price? She was married to Chris Hewn, the uh, government minister, and she took his um, speeding points and she ended up in prison. And a colleague of mine said to me, about a week after, she, I didn't know Vicky Price, about a week after she'd been sentenced, she said, um, I've sent Vicky a copy of your report. So. And uh, several weeks later, I get this letter. Please, can I come and see you? Vicky Price. And you know, she said the scales fell from her eyes. She was so shocked at the condition of these women and the fact that so many of them were there because of men. I mean, some of you won't know this. There was a woman called Angela Cannings. She was imprisoned, ooh, a good 10 years ago, for wrongly imprisoned for shaken baby syndrome. Um, she died not all that long after release, really. I think it destroyed her. But she wrote a book about her experience and said, that for most of these women, the offences they'd committed were on the face of it very trivial, and um, that they were nearly all there because of men. It's quite extraordinary. I wonder perhaps if I could ask um, our questioner, um, within... Oh, she's gone. She's left. <laughs> Well, I do know her. She's a journalist, and I suspect she's been recalled to her paper. Oh, right. <laughs> I was going to ask her what she could suggest that we might do within the boundaries of the law, obviously, to behave more badly, to agitate in a more effective way. Well, a very good way would be getting in touch with a charity called Women in Prison. <laughs> now, I do admit that I am their patron, but I tell you, they do the most fantastic work in our women's prisons on a shoestring. If I come across anybody with money, I tend to say, have you got some to spare for women in prison? They usually say no, but at least I've tried. But um, that would be a good place to start. Okay, so we all need to do that. And also at the back. So. Hi, Jean. I'm Jodie. I work part-time at Women in Prison, coincidentally, oh, right. um, alongside my undergraduate degree. Um, I think part of, um, part of what we can do is the way I think society, just generalising a little bit, speaks about these women affected by the criminal justice system. Th that's part of the problem. We, that's, that's part of the reason why we can't get down to these root causes and th understand why these women are interacting in this way and like why they are there in the first place. And I, I think uh, just an example of how we can change the rhetoric around this is that um, at, at Christmas last year, Women in Prison actually ran a social media campaign um, asking the public to donate their, their front halves of their Christmas cards because a simple thing of, of allowing women in prison to create something for their loved ones, it was, it was almost humanizing these women that are often written off as people often see those affected by criminal justice system. And I think that's part of it, it's about humanizing these women. Um, and, and something so small by saying, oh, can you donate your Christmas cards? Because actually the, these women in prison don't get to see their children very often. And sending something like a card or a letter that they've made themselves makes such a difference. It, it went absolutely viral. And it, often, often I feel um, and similarly with my colleagues at Women in Prison, is that this is, this is often viewed as like a niche cause or like a, it's not in the mainstream and people don't often donate to us. And I think something like that, I think it was really powerful. Um, and I know Yvonne was saying about being a bit more disrespectful and, and I, I think I'm all for that as well. I think it does have to get to that at some point, but I just wanted to mention that because I think the way we, we speak about these women in the media or in politics, I think that, that that could be a lot more positive, and I think that would have a powerful effect. Well, you're quite right. The way that these women are treated is often under the guise of bad girls. There was a program, a series of programs a while back about these bad girls. They are noisy. They're often noisy. But it masks a terrible vulnerability of which they are all too well aware. 
Now, about 10 years, 11 years ago, BBC Two ran a series, Women in the ins on the Inside. And I, I, that, that might have been Style Prison from memory. I think it was actually, it was BBC Northwest. And their switchboard, I don't know whether they had a website at the time, was absolutely jammed with people ringing up to say, I didn't realize people like women like that were in our prisons. They shouldn't be in prison. And in a way, the scales fell from people's, some people's eyes that they realized that these, these Noisy women are actually people who, A, shouldn't be in prison, B, are probably mentally ill, three, have, a, have survived the kind of abuse that might destroy some of us, and are survivors. And you're quite right about Christmas cards. My family always says the ones that I'm going to keep are the two or three I get from women in prison who say nice things like, I'd be, I'd be dead if it wasn't for you. Um, could I just do a little disclaimer? We are not receiving Christmas cards anymore because we've received so many. We've been overrun by Christmas <laughs> cards. Just to put that out there. Um, and I do. But yeah. I do. <laughs> okay, thank you. There were some questions hovering in the centre, so perhaps the lady Ooh, here with quite the a few dark now. hair. Hi, um, I was just wondering, what could criminal defence practitioners actually do uh, when they interact with these women in prison to kind of, I don't know, make a difference? Because, for example, you were talking about um, some of the questions on the women's centres uh, questionnaires at the start, and that seems to have really resonated with them. So I was just wondering, in daily interactions, what, what we can really say to them. Sorry, you were saying my hearing's not brilliant. Um, so I was just wondering, is there anything you'd kind of recommend that we, as criminal defence practitioners, say to these women um, when we meet them that could really make a difference to their lives? I don't know if that makes, makes well, sense. Well, I mean, there's so much more pressure now on probation. You're not, not doing proper probation reports, which do look at the realities of a woman's life. I think you have to have a feminist analysis. I think you have to be brave. You know, when I started out as a barrister and I'd represent a woman victim of domestic violence, and I used to do the domestic violence course as a matter of choice, whereas a lot of people thought it was rough trade for the junior people. And I remember one day, one of my colleagues coming back from court, because the domestic violence court was a Friday morning, and believe me, the busiest domestic violence court is the one after Christmas. That's when women get beaten up. And um, he came back and he said, I said, what have you done this morning? Oh, well, he said, I've done one injunction. I had done seven. And he said it was some, some silly cow whose husband kept beating her up. And she said she wanted, she wanted him to stop beating her up so that they could live as a family. Now, I didn't think she was a silly cow. I didn't think that was unreasonable. Most of us want a settled life. And most of us want to be in our homes. Apart from anything else, if she'd left him, where would she have gone? So I think you have to stand up. You know, I challenged that colleague, and I said to him, hang on a minute. Um, whether it made any difference to him, I don't know, but I just do think you have to challenge some of those stereotypes. And you know, it's like a ripple effect. You can make a difference. Okay, and then there was the panel. Oh, I've got a whole this stream forest. of kind of, let's take the gentleman at the back, because we haven't really had a question from a man yet. So, um, you, yeah, you with the tie. Yeah, you're, you're on the back of this row of kind of people who want to ask questions. So. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm a criminal justice policy researcher with a Westminster-based think tank, and I previously worked for the parole board. Um, and I was wondering what your thoughts were on... Um, problem-solving justice, specialised courts, these sorts of things where um, you hope that the judiciary, um, sort of like sort of right-minded judiciary are empowered to maybe have more sort of rehabilitative, a real more re rehabilitative thrust to their sentence rather than, you know, like your example of the 99, uh, the prolific shoplifter, 99, you know, 99, this is their 99th appearance in court for shoplifting. That perhaps suggests that, 
you've had 98 previously, you know, the 98 previously, uh, previous sentences have been completely inadequate. Um, so I don't know if you had any thoughts on that or whether you just think it's a buzzword um, being bandied around in criminal justice policy circles. I think the problem solving courts are fantastic. There was one in Liverpool which is closed because of lack of funding. But about 10 years ago, I was a member of the Forces, uh, the um, Howard League for Penal Reforms Commission on the Future of English Prisons. We went to New York. There was a part of New York called Red Hook, and you're nodding your head. And I say to everyone else, Red Hook was an area uh, where it was frightening to live. Drive-by shootings that were entirely random were completely normal. And I mean, they were normal. And there was a judge, and I always get his name wrong. Um, I think it was broccoli, but I'm often told I've chosen the wrong vegetable. <laughs> but it was a vegetable name. He was one of the most inspiring people I have ever come across. And he ran his court in a completely different way. I was there from early in the morning. He had a meeting with probation people, with um, mental health people, practitioners, with the local doctor, and he'd sit round and they'd talk about each person. And they would come before him. The first time they came before him, he said, the first thing you've got to do is write me an essay. I don't care about the spelling, but write to me about yourself and your life. And he would file them. And then when people came before him, if they made some kind of an excuse, he would refer to their essay but you said, what's the consequence of you having said that if now you're doing so-and-so? So there was an engagement with the offender, which I had never seen before. And something which I had never seen before and which had me in tears was there was, there was this guy. He was huge. He was powerful. Big, big Afro-Caribbean chap <coughs> whose offences had been legion. He'd been in and out of prison. He got into the Red Hook system. And he, he was standing there in the dock. And the judge referred to his, um, his profile, his little biography, and, and itemized for the benefit of everyone else what had happened to this man and how he had turned his life around. And at the end of this, he said to everyone in the room, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating this man. And we all clapped. Now, those of you who go to court, are you ever going to see that? <laughs> no. Now, there was one problem-solving court in Liverpool, but it's closed because it costs too much. I mean, if somebody didn't turn up, the judge... I've forgotten his surname, but his first name was David, would send a police, off, a police car and he'd say, go and get him, go and get her. Um, and that was a problem-solving court, and it made a big difference. Although I have to say that those of you who do, sub who do research this subject, look at what the city of Manchester's doing. It's what everyone should be doing. It was partly because the, uh, the chief constable at the time, whose first name I can't remember, but it was Fahi, um, his sur surname is Fahi. Under him, they set up this multi agency approach, which is really working in Manchester. I wish it had happened everywhere else. It's very good. Yes, I mean, I'm very struck by your sense that it's very easy to just dismiss a, um, an initiative on the basis that it costs too much. And I always feel that when people say it costs too much, they haven't properly calculated the consequential costs of not doing anything. Absolutely. And we know that women's offending is hugely expensive. Um, it is hugely so. expensive, and actually it's emotionally expensive. One of the worst things that ever happened to me when I was a barrister was that I was involved in a case of um, adoption without consent. I wasn't representing the woman. I can't remember who I represented, to be honest. But as I walked into court, just on the left, there was a chair, and there was this little woman Everything about her said poverty. Everything. And um, she was sobbing. So I realised this was the child's mother. It was a little boy of three. She had been in prison. He had been, uh, he had been taken um, 
into care and he was with foster parents who wanted to adopt him. And the professionals, you know, the, the social workers and all the rest of them, were saying, you know, what a lovely family they were. They were a middle-class family. They could provide for this boy. And he'd settled well into the family and was getting on with their, their natural-born children. And so the adoption order was given. And I felt ashamed to be in the room, except I know it happens probably every day somewhere now. And at the back, this, this, this little voice said, can I send him a Christmas present? And the judge said, yes, so long as it doesn't have batteries, because that would be a financial cost to the adoptive parents. Now, what do little boys like? They like presents with batteries. And I thought, this is what we are doing. Instead of saying, what do we do to work with this woman to help her to bring up her son? which I gather in one part of the country is now being done under the heading PAUSE, P-A-U-S-E. Right, okay, the woman in the white immediately in front of the man who just asked the last question, so. Good afternoon, I'm Christine and I'm studying international relations. And uh, it really, it's really interesting how you talk Sorry, about... Sorry, I can't hear you very well. Can oh, you... okay, better? Better, yeah. Um, it's really interesting how you talk about the system. It kind of reminds me to uh, new penology ideas. So it's like prison. It's a place where you will never uh, get out socially accepted. So uh, what would you think of methods such as... Uh, granting more paroles and electronic monitoring. Like, would that be helpful or would that be more intrusive for women or, yeah. Well, I'm on the face of it in favor of anything which involves a woman leaving prison earlier than, than intended. The only trouble with the security tagging is who's at the other end? And what work do they do? You know, just a question of checking with this little gadget on your leg. I mean, when Vicky Price came to see me, it didn't surprise me to see that she was wearing trousers that were very long and were hanging in folds at her ankle, and I thought, well, she's wearing a tag. Well, it was all right for her, a highly respected economist, very intelligent woman, professional background, you know, well off, but so many people have put on tags. It's pointless. I mean, they just go back to where they were. And I, I don't see, you know, if, if, you're, if you're going to send an, an offender back exactly to where they were, then you're just going to repeat that cycle. You have to work with people. These people have no self-confidence. They don't think they're like us. They'd love to be like us. And putting a bit of stuff on their ankles isn't going to turn their lives around. Okay, and then the lady in the group's light green. Uh. Hi, um, I'm Hannah. I'm a psychologist in the prison service. Um, I've only just joined them. I'm in the male establishment, um, but I have just finished working in children's social care. So I've had to work with a lot of children who have gone through the experiences of the women that you've worked with and a lot of women who have been in prison or are on that way. Um, I suppose this is a bit more personal. I know we've spoken a lot about legislation and what we should be doing. On a more personal level, I experienced certainly every day when I was working in children's social care how the opportunities and the privileges that I have had have been so different from these women that I was in contact with. And I'd be interested to know, in doing your report and meeting so many of these women, what resonated with you about the opportunities that you have had? You mean me personally? Well, for me it was luck. I grew up in a very poor working class family, like, unlike nearly everybody here. I had to leave at school at 16 because there was no money. So I, that was the other good thing about me that made me understand these women. Because I didn't have to tell them any of this, but I think in a way they kind of guessed it. So for me it was luck. It was just luck. Um, and I don't think we should necessarily be... And, uh, but, of course, I had, been, I had grown up in a family 
where I understood how to behave, how to speak to people. There was an emphasis on my education, such as it was, and I was loved. Those are, those are things that most of these women don't have. So, you know, starting, starting when they're 30 to try to inculcate some of this is very difficult, but it isn't impossible. And one of the things, I, I don't do it so much now. I mean, I used to go to women's prisons a lot, but to be honest with you, you take them home with you. And, you know, since I've been widowed, I have nobody on whom to offload. So instead of locking them up inside me, I don't go. But I don't need to, because I do know who these women are. And all I will say is, I know it is possible, because I have seen it time and again, to give these women self-confidence and to make them like us. And it just, it is wonderful to watch. I went to the official opening, I spoke at the official opening of the Swindon Centre a couple of years back. And I went and sat at the platform, and there was this very beautiful young woman who came and sat next to me, and she was fidgeting. So I, I said, you know, that my name was Jean, and what was hers? And she said what her name was, and, and I asked about her. And she said, well, I've been a service user. So and I asked when, and she told me. It had been a year or two before. And... Um, so, you know, I tried to chat to her sympathetically and try to find out about her, and then she really opened up. She said, four years ago, if I'd met you in the street, I'd have mugged you. <laughs> and, and I said, and now you're sitting beside me on a platform and you're going to make a speech. And she said, yes. And, I, and that was because of the Women's Centre in Gloucester. And, and I said, well, it was a privilege to share the platform with her. And it was just so wonderful to see this woman who had been, like all the women I've described, standing up and talking about the centre and what it had done for her. And, you know, she, it's, it's not rocket science, but you need some emotional intelligence. And it is sadly lacking in some places without naming them. OK, well, that strikes me as a very good question on which to finish and an excellent answer in response <laughs> to the question. So um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and asking your questions. I, I realise there were many more questions than we've had time to fill in. My answers that, are too long. Well, no, no, I mean, you know, <laughs> questions, you know, deserve proper answers. Mm -hmm. And it's important that uh, one-word answers don't kind of emanate from our speakers. So, um, so I wanted to thank all of you, and I wanted to thank you, Jean, for coming along and joining us. <laughs>